It is a privilege really to be here to uh, preach the Word of God, and uh, I am saddened that this is my last Sunday preaching on this series, so you're not going to see me probably for a while on Sunday morning. Some of you feel like that's a relief, the thorn will be removed now, since I'm preaching on the thorn, on the flesh, but that's okay. If that's how you feel, just run to these people with the red shirt, they'll help you. We have been going through uh, this series from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and uh, for the last two weeks we learned that after Paul made his case in chapter 11 and also previously to that chapter 10, when he was comparing his ministry to the ministry of the so-called false teachers, whom he sarcastically called super apostles, After he compared what he has accomplished, how he has done it, who is he in Christ, and at the same time, he played this foolish game by comparing his own genealogy, for instance, and race and accomplishments. Now he gets to a very serious point. He talks about an experience that he had in heaven. He said he was taken up to the third heaven. But when he came down, he was given, he said, a thorn in the flesh to keep him from becoming proud. We need to really remember why Paul is sharing about this experience. There is a reason why God allowed this thorn, whatever the thorn might have been, in Paul's life. Because God, who is an all-knowing, wanted Paul to remember, without this thorn, Paul... You have the tendency to be proud, and I do not want you to be proud. I do not use proud people in my ministry. We need to really appreciate sometimes why God allows difficulties in our life. I know it is so hard for us to appreciate it at that very moment. It was hard for me when I accepted Christ to appreciate the fact that I lost a marriage, that I lost a job, that I lost house, that I lost a car, that I almost lost a son. It was hard for me to appreciate that at that very moment. But today, I reflect back and I say, thank you, Lord, for training me through this. It will be hard for some who have just lost a spouse to appreciate that. But one day, I pray that you will look back and appreciate that God allowed you to go through this trial. Paul is reflecting back on a trial that was inflicted in his life 14 years earlier. He would have written this letter, by the way, around 55 or 57 A.D. 14 years prior to that, he experienced this thorn that he's been talking about. By now, he has written a number of letters. By now, he has established and planted a number of churches. Do you think God was working through Paul despite His infirmity? Absolutely. And we will see even more. So Paul says, I pleaded with the Lord three times that he should leave me, meaning this thorn, this messenger of Satan. And the Lord's response was, as always, absolutely, Paul. Ask and you shall receive. I'll just remove it for you right now. In fact, let me push a button and it will be gone immediately. As if it never happened in your life. Don't you wish that that's how God responds sometimes to us? In fact, let me ask. And by the way, this is the good news for me. This is the third service, so you're mine now. I'm going to keep on preaching Do you think Paul would have appealed to the Lord three times for something that wasn't serious or inflicting pain and agony in him? I doubt it. Do you think I would get down on my knees and pray to the Lord to improve my difficulties if I wasn't feeling the pain? You see, to to our Lord, to God, That's the message that he wants me to get. I want more of you and less of yourself. It is through these difficulties that Paul 
was willing to appeal three times for this to be removed. And God's answer was, no. You know why, Paul? Because my grace that got you to this point, despite this thorn for the last 14 years, my grace, Paul, is sufficient for you. That's what Paul heard 14 years earlier, and that's what Paul is reflecting on 14 years later. The same grace remains sufficient for Paul. The same grace was sufficient for me back then and today. And the same grace will be sufficient for you in your own difficulties, in your own issues that you're dealing with, whatever those issues might be. The same grace that got you here today remains sufficient because we serve a God that definitely is powerful and His grace is so powerful to us. So why? Because this grace is the grace of God. Notice what God says to Paul. The Lord says, my grace. He didn't say, your grace, Paul, is sufficient. He didn't say, so-and-so's grace is sufficient. He says, it is my grace, Paul, that is sufficient for you. He gets the glory. He is the source of this grace. And all that we need, by the way, is that grace. After all, who are we talking about? We're talking about the Apostle Paul, who, by the way, in his resume, when he talked about his past to the church in Philippi, he says, I was a persecutor of the church. When the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus, this is what he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? This is the same Paul. For Paul to be writing something like this, and you and I reading it and preaching from it, is a miracle in and of itself. You are a miracle to be here today in Christ. Every one of us is a miracle to be here in Christ. Now, I'm going to be frank with you. If you do not know the Lord, none of what I'm going to say will make any sense to you. Because unless you know Christ, you will never appreciate anything about this passage. Because if we do not appreciate God's work in our life and His transforming power, bringing us from a past that was miserable, filled with pride, filled with fake strength and power, into a state of weakness where we are completely dependent on Him, you're never going to understand why should I be preaching about weakness rather than strength. I mean, how often do we go around and say, hey, man, I have some wonderful news to tell you. I am so weak, it's not even funny. I'm moving on. No, we want to tell people how strong we are, how powerful we are. Even if we don't say it directly, we just spend people to get the impression that look at my position, look at what I do, look at the power that I have, look how I can handle situations and solve problems. Because that's, after all, what people are going to be talking about. They're not going to be talking about me and my weakness. They're going to be talking about my strength, my resume, my accomplishments. Paul says, in Christ, you can toss this in the garbage. I consider it all, he says, rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ my Lord. In fact, it is the same Paul who argued that I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4, 13. Jesus himself says, without me, you are nothing. It can't get any clearer than this, by the way. Without me, you're nothing. You can do whatever you want. You may think you can do it, but if you're not abiding in me, 
connected to me, attached to me, you are nothing. The world loves things that are powerful, but guess what? They're momentary. How many people, I mean, the other day alone I was just reading about those who have died and apparently they were like famous 20 years ago. I didn't even know about them. It was 20 years ago when they were famous. But in Christ, you're always the apple of his eye. You're always his child. He will always use you at all times. There is no retirement in Christ. I tell myself this all the time. I love it when people say, well, at age 57, I am going to retire. I used to think this way. In fact, I was, th- I was so ambitious. I was like, 52, I'm retired. I am 52. I'm not retired. Nowhere that I'll be retired. I don't think the Lord will even make me think of how to spell the word retirement. My wife would love for me to be retired, but that ain't going to happen. In Christ, there is no retirement. Paul, that's what he's saying. I kept going for 14 years. I don't know how much longer. I'll keep going. Let me give you an example of how much longer Paul was able to keep going. Why? Because the power of God was perfected in him through this weakness. Now think about this. Paul says, 14 years earlier, I received this thorn. Now many believe that incident would have been around 41 AD. Remember what I told you about the vision if you were here two weeks ago? I said it appears that there is two incidents of visions that are similar to each other, seeing the Lord. The first one was Stephen, and Paul was watching Stephen getting stoned. The second vision that we talk about here is Paul. Apparently, it happened also after he was stoned, because he's been stoned. So my advice to all of us was, get stoned, you'll see the Lord immediately. That's not a problem at all. Paul says, 14 years ago, I had this difficulty. Today, I am preaching it to you, he says. I'm writing to you about it. I'm reflecting on it. That would have been probably around 55, 57 AD. But by the time you measure all of Paul's accomplishment, by the time he was executed, and many believe it would have been 67 AD, Paul would have done a number of missionary journeys planted a number of churches. Many believe it would have been anywhere from 14 to 20 churches that if we are counting 13 letters, almost half of the New Testament, many names of people that he has mentored or were his apostles or traveled with him. All of this in a span of 26 years, give or take, with a thorn in his flesh. That's a very impressive resume, if you ask me. A very impressive resume. How did he accomplish this? By the power of God. That caused Paul to continue to grow and mature in his ministry. And we'll see in a little bit how Paul talked about the conclusion of his journey, of his ministry that he has done. This is Paul, who have just accomplished all of these things that I shared with you, but at the same time, his journey to say it was bumpy is an underestimate, actually, because look how he reflected back on that journey. In 2 Corinthians 11, from verses 23 to 29, I'll just give you glimpses of what Paul says. During my journey, he says, not only I have this thorn in the flesh, but five times I received at the hands of the Jews, he says, the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. And then he kept on going. And then he started talking about danger. He says, I have danger from robbers. Danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, not to mention the daily pressure. Was he able to accomplish God's purposes through all of these infirmities and insults and weaknesses and persecutions? Absolutely. 
In fact, the work of the Apostle Paul is why 200 plus years later, an entire empire, the Roman Empire, embraced Christianity as the religion of its identity. The work of one apostle who called himself a persecutor of the church. It is so funny how things work, by the way. The Lord says, you are going to persecute the church? No problem, my friend. You are going to be planting churches as a punishment from, ta from now until the day you meet me. In fact, I remember when I first accepted the Lord, and I'm no Paul. I said, Lord, thank you so much for opening my eyes to know you after living this life for 30 plus years of my life. Two things I do not want to know what I do, Lord. I do not want to minister to Muslims anymore, and I do not want to serve Arabs or Saudis. And the Lord is like, here is a problem we have to deal with. When I recruit you, you do not tell me what you want to do and not to do because you apparently have an I problem. I want to do this and I do not want to do this. But I'm going to give you an in solution. You're going to be in Christ and you're going to be injected with a thorn. And you'll learn how to serve me from that point forward. What do you think I invest my time daily doing? Witnessing to who? Saudis, Arabs, and Muslims. Who won the battle? The Lord. Did I get the message? Absolutely. Does he know how to deliver the message straightforward and convince you? Without a doubt. Paul had a moment. Jonah had a moment. The difference between the two is this. Jonah wanted to go to Spain when God says, wait a minute. I said that way. Paul, in Romans 15, wanted to go to Spain. Why? Because there, no one has heard the name of Christ yet. And the Lord says, absolutely. Same destiny. Different attitude, different purpose. That's what it means that the grace of God is sufficient. When we are living that grace, when we are ambassadors of that grace, powerful and mighty things can happen in our life through our very weaknesses that we keep complaining about. In Galatians, this is what Paul mentioned to the church over there. He says, when God, who had set me apart before I was born and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, so that I might proclaim his, uh, him among the Gentiles. He's reflecting back and saying, God has a purpose for me. From before I was even born, God has his sight on me. Brothers and sisters, God has his sight on you if you know him today. You may never understand why the change of direction. You may never appreciate where God placing you today. But I assure you, he has a powerful mission for you. He has a powerful mission for me. He has a powerful mission for anyone who comes to a saving knowledge in him. We don't serve a God that is mediocre, by the way, a wishy-washy, who may or may not be there for you. This is the same God who says, go and make disciples, and at the same time, I will be with you until the end of the age. Why? Because my grace is sufficient for you. And you're going to need it. And you are going to be insulted. You are going to be humiliated. You are going to be ridiculed. You are going to be told that things that you're doing cannot work. You ought to consider doing it this way or that way because there is the spirit of competition in ministry. When I walked into ministry, I was so excited that I am going to be working with these wonderful people. There'll be no more miserable attitudes and no competition anymore. No one is going to disrespect me. Everybody is going to be loving the Lord. After all, we're all going to be praying and praising the Lord. A week later, 
The Lord says, how do you like it so far? Is it working for you? You're walking with people who are still walking in the flesh. They need me. It is my grace that is sufficient. Anywhere you go, you are going to need that grace. You know, yet, uh, yet there is another thing that I want to share with you about this grace. How often do we remember Ananias? Remember last week we talked about Ananias? The Lord appeared to Ananias and says, Ananias, I want you to go to this house. There is this man, Saul, who is praying right now, has seen you in a vision that you're going to go and you are going to deliver my message to him and he will be healed. And Ananias was immediately overwhelmed by this task. Is like, what? Come again? Are you asking me to go to this Saul who has been persecuting your own saints? What do you think the Lord told him? Ananias, my grace is sufficient for you. You go and I'll take care of the rest. Ananias trusted in this grace and he departed. That's what the scripture says and went. In obedience to this grace, I preach to you today from the Apostle Paul's writing because of a nobody named Ananias. Now, I know you may think I'm exaggerating this, but why in the world would God mention anything about Ananias to us unless he wants you to know that I can use any vessel to make my point? It was Ananias that delivered the message of healing to Paul. He spoke the word of God, and things like scale fell off his eyes, and he was filled by the Holy Spirit. He got baptized, and we know what happened from that point forward. Are you an Ananias? Is there a soul in your life? Do you feel that God is calling you to go to someone and you're hesitating to do so because of you feel that you are incapable? You feel like you are not qualified? You feel like you're weak in your approach? Remember what we said last week? If you're feeling fear and trembling and butterflies in your stomach, you qualify. Because that's how Paul feel. felt, I should say. That's how he described himself when he goes to share the gospel. I'm sure God will have a soul in your life. He just wants you to be the one to go to him. And I pray that you will reflect back and realize that the grace of God is sufficient for you. Now, what is the outcome from this grace? Contentment. We ought to be, this is the third point. I'm going to just uh, leave it here for a second. Contentment is what the scripture says. This is what verse 10 says. For the sake of Christ, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? First point. We are content in Christ by his grace. Not by our work, not by the grace of someone else, not by the favor we receive from anyone, not by the acceptance of the Corinthian church of Paul. They turned their back on him for a second. It is the grace of God that caused Paul, that caused me, that hopefully will cause each one of us to be content even through the difficulties and the challenges that we will face in our work, our calling, and our ministry. That's how Paul managed through all of this. Our Lord himself tells us not to respond to these insults with insults, not to try to remove these difficulties using our own wisdom, not to respond to evil with evil, but rather, sometimes even those that hate us and persecute us, we ought to respond in a drastic way by praying for them, by loving them. Paul in 1 Corinthians 4.12 says the following, When reviled, we actually bless. 
When persecuted, we endure. We don't fight back. When slandered, we trial to conciliate. Now, that's a drastic attitude. Only by the grace of God, you are able to accomplish this. Left to us, by the way, in our flesh, none of this will happen. Because if I want to handle it my way, when reviled, I'm going to kill the person in front of me. When persecuted, I'm going after you and suing you and doing all kinds of things to you. And Jesus is like, it doesn't work that way. My grace won't be sufficient if that's what you're doing. No one will know that you are associated with me if you behave in such a way. You see why this grace requires humbleness and humility and obedience and surrender. If anyone wants to follow me, he must first deny himself. That's how it goes in this grace that is sufficient. And life difficulties will be thrown at you. James 1 tells us, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Notice, you will meet trials, and you will meet trials of various kinds. Your attitude has to be joy. Now, maybe you're not joyous at that moment. God gets it. But this is the attitude that we ought to develop. It's a training process. My son went through the Marines, and the first 13 weeks were miserable. They call him basic training. There is nothing basic about them. But 13 weeks later, he called me, sir. I'm like, I love this training. Can he get 13 more? We're going through basic training all the time. Life in Christ is a basic training. Challenges and difficulties will be thrown your way. So why do we need to be content with this grace? Because it gives us that strength, that power. We are strong in this grace by the power of Christ. We can handle things. He gets the glory. If we succeed, he's the one that was behind this success. Because when we were weak, we were strengthened by him. And by the way, this weakness that we go through will never ever reveal the power of God if we try to fix it our way. But if we surrender to God himself and let his power shine through it, only then glory will be given to him. Ask Gideon how he managed to do it. Ask David how he defeated Goliath. Ask how Daniel handled lions in the lion's den. Ask how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego dealt with that fiery furnace if it wasn't for that grace that was sufficient for them. Only through these difficulties that they went through that the power of God shone through their stories. Why? Because we do not serve, by the way, a God that is dead. We serve a deliverer, a living God who hears. Look what God says, for instance, through the psalmist in Psalm 106, verses 44 to 45. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress. He's looking, talking about the people of God who, by the way, rebelled against God. They went into exile, but God, as a passionate father, says he heard their cry and then he delivered them. Why? According to the abundance of of his steadfast love. We serve a God that loves us and loves us dearly. I'm going to leave you with this before I get to the application point. Paul went through all of this, and at the conclusion of his ministry, he reminded Timothy of his legacy in the last 26 plus years with a thorn in his flesh. This is what he says. Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, by the way, verses 1 to 8, I charge you, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Why? For the time is coming, he says, when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myth. Now, that doesn't apply to us today, by the way. Don't get me wrong. 
Okay? We have wonderful people today that love to hear the truth. Everything is just hunky-dory out there. Life is just fine. As for you, he says, Timothy, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. What about me? For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, says Paul. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Are you able to say this? This is a man that has a thorn in his flesh for 26 years, and he believes he has accomplished what God has called him to do. My prayer is that each one of us will be able to stand before him one day and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, because his approval is all that matters to us. That's the legacy that we want to leave. And let me give you a couple of points of application. The grace of God is sufficient for us and powerful in us because it sustains us through our pain. It empowers us to do the calling and the ministry that God placed before us. And it forces us to trust in him and lean on him. I'll leave you with this question. In which way and in which area of your life today do you believe that the grace of the Lord is sufficient in your life? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for any thorn that you place or allow to be placed in our flesh, Lord. Thank you for the weaknesses, the insults, the calamities, the persecutions, the hardships that you put us through. Because it allows us, Lord, to rely on you, to trust in you, and to appeal to you. And to recognize your power through our weakness, Lord. Help us always remember that your grace and grace alone is sufficient for us. In Jesus' name, amen.